Welcome everyone, wherever you're connecting from. Um, my name is Silvia Gigante, and today on the third day of our conference, Doing Global Gender Perspectives on Gender and Reglobalization, we're going to focus on intersectional and post-colonial perspectives on gender. We're going to have two keynotes and after every keynote, a 10 minute discussion. With great pleasure, I welcome our first guest, um, Professor Jane Bennett. She's head professor of African feminist, feminist studies at the University of Cape Town. She also holds the position of director of the postgraduate studies in the humanit humanities faculty and is honorary professor of gender at the Nehanda Center for Gender and Culture at the great Zimbabwe University. In the past, she has authored Port Supin, a collection of short stories nominated for the Commonwealth Prize, and many academic articles covering sexual harassment, the politics of queer, um, gender based violence, and African feminist epistemology. Recently, she co edited two books Jacket Women Qualitative Research Methodologies in Gender gender and sexualities and new thinking in gender and sexualities research in African context. Welcome, um, Professor Bennett. Um, we are excited to having you here. And with, without further ado, I will leave you the floor so that we don't waste any time. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming through. I wish it was possible for me to actually be seeing you with your faces and how you are sitting and how I ask how you are in this very difficult world of ours. And it is a great privilege to be able to occupy a little bit of, of your time. I am going to start with, um, and I hope it will be worth it for you. I'm going to share my screen and begin with a presentation and do a few more thank yous before we before we get going. Let me do the share screen thing. I'm hoping everybody is able to see. And let me just reiterate my thanks for your attention and my thanks in particular to Sylvia Gigante and the team at URAC who has been very supportive and very generous in affording me this opportunity. I've been able to be a participant in one or two of the panels that have been organized for this very interesting conference and the synergies and energies in the discussion make me very humble to be somebody coming through to engage with you today. And yes, this is me. I am I'm Jane. I work at the University of Cape Town right at the tip of the African continent, a very complex zone. I suppose we all live in complex zones. I'm, I work in a department newly called African Feminist Studies. I'm going to say a little bit about this. And I thank Sylvia for the generous introduction. I suppose I am also a person who moves across the theoretical, I sometimes work very philosophically, and at other times, extremely practically. I do a lot of work, particularly in relation to issues of gender-based violence, um, as a counselor, as an activist. And this is the photograph that I sometimes use for, for my students. Um, should we participate if the author Looks like this. I'm excited for the time 25 minutes from now when I get maybe to hear a little bit from you about your responses to what is an opportunity for thinking that you have given me within, within your own day 
and thank you um, to the conference organizers for offering that as well. The title of the presentation is quite long, and what it, I'm going to be doing is try to work through some of the theorizations of this term gender that are at the heart of the conference's interests in the idea of re-globalization. And I'm particularly going to focus today on the issue of cyber technologies. Re-globalization, of course, involves much more than cyber technology, but I have a short amount of time, so I want to choose a focus. I do want to start with some transparency, a little bit of contextualization about where I'm coming from. Then I'll move into what I call a theoretical worry, a worry that comes to me through some of my work, which is, which is researching theory as theories grow, as they contextualized, and of course, as they show and often don't show the experiences from which we need to build our deepest and most interesting and strategic knowledges. And the final section will look at what I believe the concept of gender justice must ask of the digital. If I'm going too fast, may I ask that any one of the team that is supporting me here in NURAC simply gives me a sign, um, helps me to slow down or to repeat something that, that you'd like to hear or see again. So the first section, my, my location, um, I am located digitally. This is a website. I'm located in relation to a vast team that is both thoroughly networked across the continent, but also tiny in the actual bodies that work in the African Gender Institute. This is just an example of an event we held last year where what we are aiming to do is to create partnerships of research and knowledge creation and networking that are deeply rooted in continental realities. And for me, continental is the African, which despite its multiple diversities does constitute a critical, historical, and political root. And I'm going to say something about that root in a moment. You can find us in relation to both African feminist studies, where we teach postgrad and graduate programs, a large, a large consortium. That work is largely funded by the university. And you'll also find us through the African Gender Institute, that's the URL I offered, where we raise money from a wide consortium of donors and we engage in research projects. Those we're doing at the moment have to do with sex worker-led theater, with Muslim law and sexuality, with issues of racism, in science and technology education, and the institute is directed by my colleague and friend Yaliwe Clark. And I suppose that leads me to wanting to respond to what might be one of your questions. Well, what is African feminist studies? What makes any relationship? with gender analysis through a feminist lens, African. And there would be so many answers to this. But because we are a, a global community here um, this afternoon, I wanted to explain to you 
so that you understand something of my location and can interrogate or question it later. Where am I coming from as somebody who works in African feminist studies? And I would want to say that these feminisms for me are rooted in pan-African decolonial work, which began in the early 20th century. This work had precursors before that, but the moments of so-called flag democracy, where a new flag was run up, a flagpole starting with Ghana in 1957, and the last one was, of course, South Africa in 1994. A whole compendium of decades of engagement with what it meant to, um, whoops, I went too fast there, what it meant to move officially, formally away from the colonial. And that was a resistance movement. And it was a movement that also respected deeply as we continue to do the meaning of indigeneity, the meaning of very complex contextual and historical difference. And also for us in African feminist studies, where I work, it means that we center the analysis and the disruption of what we call the decoloniality of gender. That what we have, if you like, inherited as the legacies of colonialisms, of course, these are multiple, of course, they're complex and not one, but colonial gender views tend to center a binary to gender that is highly intolerant of any forms of gendered and sexual practice process that do not fall into that gender binary. And if we turn a historical lens to contextual contexts, we find in the continent, we find many, many examples of synergies that are gendered for masculinity and femininity that do not now cohere with notions of a simple binary. And of course, some of the material that we can use to see this is very caught up in contemporary debates about gender and sexuality, and it can be very hard to think outside our own naturalized frames for the idea of being women or having male bodies. But if, if you do your own searches, here are some words that would work for African contexts. There would be many that would work for European or Latin American contexts, where we can find much material that suggests that while we are currently still, many of us, deeply immersed in what I would call the coloniality of ideas of gender, there is much to be gained from the work which tries to destabilize this. You'll all be familiar with the work of Maria Lugones, who talks about the idea that European colonialisms produced a way of collectivizing notions of gender and race, and that this way of thinking, gender as racialized, gender as a binary hierarchical relation to power, that's a key colonial tool, wherever we may be, whether we may be sitting in Botswana or in Milan or in New York, this idea of the binary as the way to think gender remains strongly powerful and it is colonial. Dubonnes 
is building on the work of Anibal Ejano, and he writes about what power means, economic power, extractivist power, systems of governmental authority as colonial, and Lugones tends to deepen it. And there are many theorists, this is a particularly well-known um, African feminist theorist, Kiro Nguezu, who agrees with her. And the place that I am located, therefore, is within a decolonial approach to gender. It means that we continually need to try and explore histories of conventional gender norms. We need to look at how colonialisms, even if we think we're very far from them, tried to remake gender norms. And it means that the illumination of flows of power that may exploit or violate or marginalize the particular constituencies need an African first in histories and theories of colonialisms and feminist committed to the destabilization of the deployment of coercive gender norms within praxis socioeconomic environments. It needs that perspective. That's what African and feminist brings to my life. And an additional note has to do with the fact that I've been in a university and national context for some years in which key contextual debates about what knowledges entail, what decolonial knowledges entail, ask for a revolution which remembers always how those who transgress gender norms are at the center often of new ways of strategy. And that's an in-depth um, relationship to my location, but I chose to take the time so you can understand a little more about both the limitations and perhaps the strengths of where I am. And in my shorter second section, I want to say, okay, from there, how do I think about the archaeologies and conjunctures and clashes that in 2022 we live through gender theorization? Those of us who've been in this conference for the past couple of days will have heard over and over and over and over again an engagement with gender theory that persistently separates people along a gender binary, men and women. There are many hortatory caveats. Many speakers you will have heard saying, remember intersectionality, remember to think masculinity, remember that women are diverse. And all those caveats, of course, are critical and rich. But when you listen very carefully to work on reglobalization and gender, whether it's about access or access to resources, meanings of violence, again and again, you'll hear people forcing themselves to revert to the gender binary. And that means taking a really deep analytical breath. What do theories that prioritize the need for radical change, what do they do? They tend to, they tend to be visionary. They tend to work to reclaim, to recenter possibilities of human being. They often have a desire for global reach. And we find them working with imaginaries of hierarchy. They often produce a suffering other, particularly in development theories. And of course, they're the inspiration for multiple resistance and revolutionary energies. And but think of some examples that are 
very within our current theoretical lives. Think of, and I'm being very simplistic here, but I am going somewhere. Please bear with me. Think of Marxist feminism. So it's engaging the meaning of labor, the theorization of roles and interests and relationship and market institutionalization of economic exploitation. It produces a category, a number of categories. One of them is workers. We see the same, and it's global. It's a globalizing narrative. It has to be, it's a theory. We look at, for example, Anthropocene-focused environmental feminism. Their work on the meaning of the natural and the living, theorization of categories, extractivisms, the illumination of exploitations of entities beyond the human, and the production of the earth and sentience, and activism in the name, in the name of workers, in the name of the earth. And when we look at theorization of the digital, we can go back to her work in the 1980s, on a Haraway, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess, the excitement of the virtual as potential for reimagining the human, Braitotti, in, in Amsterdam, amazing scholar, Rosie Braitotti, looking at theories of virtual engagement, looking at the global work of APC women. And yet, and yet, we come back when we look at contemporary research on the digital, on labor, on the environment, very often to the notion of women through gender analysis, particularly in theorization of the digital. UNESCO uploaded a report yesterday on what it called the gendered digital divide, talking about the category women. And indeed, according to Internet World Stats, 47% of African people don't have digital access. It's very different, that ratio, in some other contexts. But I want to borrow a phrase from the New York um, performance artist, I suppose she is, Fran Leibovitz. Imagine it's a city. Imagine that what we are not trying to do is theorize a world through a binary. Imagine that it's holographic. Imagine that there are many, many, many zones that cannot be seen through your theory. Imagine we're not simply looking for a gap in a knowledge body, so a digital divide. There's Bruno Catalano's French sculpture work, a gap in a body. We're not looking for a gap in a body. We are trying to see disappeared. And when we start thinking about reglobalization, the globes made possible digitally, we know how the notion of the fourth industrial revolution is so deeply embedded into late 21st, late 20th, early 21st century globalization, everything from access to smartphones to AI. But to take my question about how do we theorize without, as people interested in gender, without simply dividing the world into women and men, in order to see the gap. What if we try and analyze the four IR that is so embedded into zones of labor, trade, communication, mobility, production, the self? We can think about all the advantages, the reorganization of networks, the colonization of certain borders, solidarity building, we can think about some of the huge problems, surveillance, new violences, stratospheric increase in class-based distances. And we want to say, okay, what does this mean? 
for agendas emerging from commitments to re-globalization and gender justice. Where and who are the disappeared? If we refuse women people as a way of adequately seeing the disappeared, theoretically, Who can we find? Let's reimagine, let's retain the wisdom of the acknowledgement that gendering is a process which involves flows of power, but involves them intersectionally, involves them in ways that we need to look beyond the category of women. Every time you see that category, women, just stop, I invoke. And I say, who is being hidden in that word? Which people are being hidden? Which people are being seen? Which women? Which men? Which people who are neither categorized as women and men? We need some more vectors, the incarcerated, the about to be incarcerated, those excluded digitally from the worlds colonized by 4IR as a mode of work and identity, the undocumented, those in domestic work, those in many forms of sex work, those working as primary extractivists, minors, those in migrant forms of agricultural labor, those trapped domestically by abuse, those institutionalized by illness, old age, the addicted, the too sad, the exhausted and the uncategorizable, those without homes. Our use of gender needs to be able to move into zones where we can see the disappeared without necessarily always invoking purely a gender binary. Because those zones of being, human beings, those acoherent, diasporic, multilingual, multi-representational people have knowledges on the operation of power that are essential to what I would call an exploded lens, not a binary lens, on being human. I wanted to move to ending what has been quite a driven and quite a theoretical presentation from a student essay that I've just read. She gave me permission to cite it, but not to give her name. Um, which I'm sad about. She's amazing. She said, if the past two years of digital incarceration because of COVID shutdown has taught me anything, it's that while I do value all those apps and the fact that I can somehow communicate when I can't see people, I've become inhuman. I'm so much more scared, much more shy. My confidence has taken a blow. I mistrust so much and so many. And as a young black woman, I feel recolonized. I feel recolonized. I have lost my people. This world is not mine. It is not for me. Now, I'm, I'm not a Luddite. Internet warriors abound. If I had a bit more time, I'd want to tell you about what is happening here. Um, for young women's protest against Jacob Zuma, protest in the name of invisibilization and protest digitalized. There are so many, and I'm using South African examples here because I want to be accurate. There are so many organizations working on digital access, on solidarity and queer movement building. We have amazing cyber activists. There's a lot of the use of what I would call low value social media like Facebook or Instagram. Um, to organize. There's a strong, um, there's a strong internet campaign and 
written by South Africans called the social shutdown, the total shutdown around gender-based violence. I'm not saying no internet. What I'm saying is this, and I'm sorry for um, the density of it, but um, I'm hoping that it might find some resonance for us in this conference. I'm saying that from where I come, from my location as an African feminist, questions of re-globalization, which have to reckon with the vast impact of 4IR digital technologies in the public and private realms, can be driven by the recognition that of the disappearance of human beings is in fact integral to the enterprise of the digital. The digital is an exercise in the digitization of human presence and the potential of that digitization for many forms of capital accumulation. So yes, let's work on seeing the disappeared, but let's work also on knowing how we are being disappeared as digital citizens. If we are to imagine gender as heuristically able to open up the horizons of what we are screened away from, we may be interested in a re-globalization which can return the digital to the realm of tool, where we are not tool. We use the tool. We choose bodies over cyborgs. We choose actual energies and their depletion over the assumption of the 24-7 of electricities. And we choose real, messy, intersectional life over the realities of not seeing actual death. I thank you. I welcome questions, interrogation, and exasperation. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Professor Bennett. There were many inputs and many thoughts, very interesting, um, especially as the last two years will all lift more digitally. So I think it's very important to also highlight um, the negative effects or what, um, yeah. So we already have some questions. I'm going to start um, with a broader, broader one. So how could digitalization or technology be used to strengthen inclusive gender developments? As you said, um, the access is a problem. And how can we avoid that the gap becomes bigger? Do you want me to answer questions one by one? Yes, we can do that, if it's okay Thank with you. you. Thank you for the question. Um, the question assumes that I'm interested in a gap. And many are, many are. I, I can refer you to, to that, that, in fact, UNESCO report, which, which I referred to yesterday, where there are many suggestions where they assume a gap. They assume the gap is between women and men. They use a gender binary and they talk a lot about a holistic approach to what they call narrowing that gap. One that thinks about basic education, that thinks about women and girls' access to everything from smartphones to data, to training, to embedding um, digital literacy into all levels of, of living, whether it's trade or communication or mobility. And digitization certainly has shown that it offers 
new options for all those things where it is available. What I have tried to do today is not about a gap. It's about saying we don't know what we're talking about. If you assume a gap, you have already got a universe, right? You've got a globe. And you've got some parts of the globe filled in and some parts there's a gap. And then you try to narrow that gap. And some people call that men versus women. I think there are many uses to that as a theoretical strategy. But what I've tried to suggest, first through invoking intersectionality, that in order to understand and then decolonialism, not thinking of gender as about a gap produced by a binary, but as thinking about it as a way of seeing those who are disappeared, who may be gendered in their context as men, as women, as transgender and who will also be racialized, who will also have class and religious contexts. And whether the digital can see those bodies is a question in and of itself. Those bodies are not useful for digital consumer interests. They can't buy anything. They have no money. Sorry for the long answer. It's not that I don't appreciate the question, but perhaps I'm not the best person to answer it. No, that's totally fine. And how does the categorization work in the dig dig digital space? So what um, dangers for equality lie behind the bias algorithms, for example. And as you said, the one, yeah, all the people who are marginalized. So how does the categorization work? How it works is the, is the subject of a discussion. Um, the, the work that goes into those algorithms is staggering and of a level of technological power and investment that is beyond um, maybe, I mean, to, to talk about, I mean, I could talk about that, but how those algorithms actually work is, is a project deeply invested in capital accumulation. So, that those algorithms generate categories of both content and communities that they interface with each other and call that knowledge. We know that. So again, the question is, how do we find what we don't know? And that's, that's my theoretical conundrum, right? And I, I don't have an answer to it, but what, what my examples tried to get at was once, say I was one, once a Marxist feminist, and I indeed was once a Marxist feminist. And theoretically, I could reach a minor, right? I'm not a minor. I can reach them theoretically in my mind. I can think of their masculinity, I know where they are located. I have a global theory. I can reach the worker in my theory. Digital theorization, I quite literally cannot reach within a digital economy. I cannot reach the one who is not digitalized. I have become digitalized. I cannot see them. That, for me, is a key question. How do we, thinking about race, thinking about colonialism, how do we understand 
the operation of digital as a colonization and how do we fight it? I am very, very tempted, even as I see my most respected colleague and digital and intellectual friend, Oyeronke Oyewumi, appearing, and she's appearing digitally, and I want to hug her. Also, what I want to do is just turn the screen off and show you the trees outside my garden and say, yes, algorithms are dangerous, but are we really here? And what is making us think that we are? Can we hold on to that and maximize it?